Hey, good morning. Hola. Yeah, good morning. Good morning. You have your Bibles open to Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Yeah, here you want to hear, mister. Oh, okay. Oh. All right. Uh, Matthew 28. Matthew 28. Uh, if you have a Bible, open up to Matthew 28. Okay, so we are week 8 now of our Baptist Distinctives. We're looking at the second of the two T's, and that is uh, two ordinances. Uh, we're going to be breaking this up into two weeks. We're going to be looking at baptism today, and then week following we're looking at Lord's Supper. But the two ordinances uh, that are given are baptism and Lord's Supper. And so that's what we're going to be looking at, baptism, today, of the two ordinances, Matthew 28. Uh, verse 16, verse 16. And then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain, where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Okay, so baptism. This isn't the first mention we've seen in Scripture of baptism, but this is uh, where it is commanded following Christ's resurrection, and it specifically addressed that uh, not only to his disciples, but those that would follow, that they would go forth, and the word there, teach, um, it's literally a big compound word in the original language that basically means make disciples, so he wants believers to go forth, he initially come, uh, ordained uh, not just the twelve, but also the it would it would be basically the 120 the disciples that were with uh, the 12 apostles and that they would go forth and then they're supposed to go to all nations and make disciples of all nations and something that he mentions kind of seems like in passing with that is that he's supposed to baptize them or they're supposed to baptize them the ones that basically are born again because uh, that's the initial point that's the starting point of becoming a disciple is being born again uh, that you would following that, baptize them, and then following that, that they would teach them to observe all things whatsoever commanded. So, uh, next question that follows, or logical question, what is baptism? What is it? What is it? It's not a very common word, uh, but what is it? What does it mean? What is the water? Yes. Yeah, okay. It, just, it literally means just to immerse, to dunk. Okay, so that's what it would be uh, in its verb form, but to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, uh, to cleanse by dipping or submerging, to wash, to make clean with water, to wash one's self, bathe. Now, the reason that would be brought about is because what happens when you wash something? It's clean. You're baptizing when you wash your dishes, right? Yeah, you, you stick it in water. <laughs> At least I would imagine, right? You don't just like spray it or sprinkle it. You, you stick it under the water, you know, with soap, and then or you scrub it. My, uh, my grandma up in Columbia, they had, uh, it looks like a big box. It, it kind of similar to what a, uh, uh, what a utility sink would be out in somebody's yard. But they had, it was a big concrete box in their yard. They had like a angle, maybe almost cut at a 45 degree with little slats on it. And then that's what they would wash their clothes in by hand until my uh, uncle's got her uh, a washing machine and then you know, she'd have to do it like that. But Anyway, so what you do is uh, stick the clothes in the water. You fill it partially with water and then stick the clothes in and then you have a big bar soap or whatever that you use and you scrub. But anyway, so you are you're putting something underwater. That's literally really what the word means. In English, we just have taken it and literally transliterated it because that's what that word is right here. Uh, but you don't, it literally just means to immerse, to submerge, to put on the water. Okay, and here's what it would look like. Okay, so uh, 
the actual act of it in the performance. I had a hard time trying to figure out how to get a GIF put on there so you would see the motion. Uh, so, what's that? Is that yours? No. <laughs> I'm not that good. <laughs> so, at the commencement, when you're up in the water, it's as if, okay, you've been crucified. When you're put under the water, it's as if you're buried with him. And then when you come up out of the water, it's like you're raised to walk in the of life the same way that Jesus, uh, what, what basically what Jesus had done. And uh, beyond just, okay, what, what it is, as far as that it's literally immersing, it is meant for two things. First off, it's an illustration of what Christ has done for us. Okay, it's an illustration of what Christ has done for us. So this is in picture form, uh, but it represents that Jesus died for me, he rose again, he was buried and he rose again from the dead. He did that for me and then I've received him. In other words, I, since I've come to Christ, uh, when a person comes to Christ, they trust Christ, what he had done. That he died for them to pay for their sins, but he didn't just stay dead. He rose again from the dead three days later so that they would have new life. And so it's a declaration basically saying, hey, look, that's happened to me. I've done that. I'm identifying myself with Jesus now. I'm part of Jesus' family. I'm part of, basically, I'm, I'm part of God's family. And so that's what that is. That's what you're declaring whenever uh, a person is baptized. Now, mind you, this is all Jesus' idea because we see there at Matthew 28, we would go to the other gospel portions, we'd see the same thing as far as that Christ commanded. Well, he says, preach the gospel to every creature in Mark. And then in Luke, that uh, repentance and remission of sins should be preached among all nations beginning then at Jerusalem. And then, uh, you know, in Acts 1 8, that uh, you, you'll be witnesses unto me. And Part of what they were witnesses of was the fact that, okay, yeah, he died for their sin, he rose again from the dead, and that they were baptized to identify themselves with the fact that, hey, what, I'm, I'm, I'm with Jesus, you know, he did this for me. So it's a picture of what has happened. Second of all, it's also a declaration of a believer's allegiance. Okay, I'm going to live for him from here forward. Uh, this isn't always brought about, but it is uh, valid, it is true. The fact is that we're raised to walk in newness of life, and so um, you see this a little bit more. I'm not saying that you don't see it here in the U.S., but as far as you see this a little bit more um, in Eastern Europe, from some of the reading I've uh, encountered, that uh, at least what was under Soviet Russia, a lot of believers uh, before they could be baptized had to go through like some really stringent. Uh, it, I guess really in a sense like a uh, course on what it means to be a believer and that kind of thing and then they would have like six months of observation before they were kind of worthy of being baptized uh, I don't see that in scripture I mean truth is is that you see um, even <coughs> first whenever Peter preached at Pentecost that those that believed actually turn there real quick go to Acts chapter 2 Acts chapter 2 Verse 41, okay, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Um, then if you go reading on forward, it says they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking bread and of prayers. But um, it says that they that gladly received the word were baptized. How long a period was that? Same day. Yeah. Peter had preached basically to the crowd that was responsible for Jesus being crucified. Well, I mean, that's all of us in reality, but as far as those that would have been yelling out, crucify him, when a week before they would have been praising him, 
you know, Hosanna, glory to God in the highest, uh, putting the palms down and all that. And then um, here now, you know, his blood be upon us and upon our children. At least, and then he preaches to them that, hey, the same Jesus whom you've crucified had God made, you know, Lord. And then, you know, they're convicted in their hearts, they're pricked in their hearts, and they cry out, men and brethren, what do we do? He says, you know, uh, repent and be baptized for remission of sins. Then they get baptized, they, the ones that received, or excuse me, the ones that received his word were baptized that same day. So I don't see that that is uh, something that's necessary. Uh, and quite frankly, that ends up that, that ends up being something a little bit more man-centered, I think, than anything else. But uh, you have his uh, declaration of a believer's allegiance. Okay, I want to live for God. Okay, and it's a command to be obeyed. A command to be obeyed. A command to be obeyed. Um, now, who's commanded... Yes. Okay, so in other words, it's a command for the church, for the believers that have already been to go forth and baptize people, and then it obviously it would be for the ones that would be. Uh, go to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. We've already seen in Matthew 28 that Jesus had told the disciples to you know, go forth and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, but Acts chapter 8. Uh, go down to verse 26. We're going to be skipping a little bit here through. But verse 26. Okay, and the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, uh, queen of Ethiopian, uh, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, and read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto him, Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, un and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I? except some man should guide me. And he desired Philip that he, should, that he would come up and sit with him. Uh, the place of the scripture where he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb, was, uh, like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. So he's reading in Isaiah 53. Okay, in his humiliation, his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. Okay, and then the eunuch answered, uh, Philip and said, I pray thee of whom speakest the prophet? Speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man. Uh, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So it, it's pretty obvious who it would be for the believer. Okay, and then as they went on their way, uh, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Okay, I. Um, well, well, we'll read on. We'll read on before I address it. Okay. And then Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the, the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, uh, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And then when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit, said, uh, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. All right, so uh, there's a number of things that you can address here. Uh, first thing was, um, where did he get that idea about being baptized to begin with? Like, why would he even bring that up to begin with? I mean, he just, mm -hmm. sir? He probably saw others before. That could be, that could be. The truth is we don't have a clue, other than that maybe it would have been something that he would have been told by Philip, uh, but he could have, at any rate, the thing is we don't know, all we know is that he's preached unto him who Jesus is, and he's preached it to him from when he was reading in scripture as far as from Isaiah 53, and then 
all of a sudden he comes across water. He's like, hey, what? Why you know? Why can't I be baptized? What would stop me from being baptized? Uh, and then it says specifically here that go into the water and then come up out from the water. All right. So we see the mode of baptism itself, uh, because it's supposed to illustrate the death, burial, resurrection. You go down under the water, as well as what the word means is that it means to be immersed. So they come up out from the water. And uh, also the candidate for baptism. Uh, it says here in particular, you know, he says, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And then here's his testimony. He says, I believe that Jesus is Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In other words, I believe Jesus is Messiah. Uh, he had already made a choice in his heart to accept Christ as his Savior. So it wouldn't be just some random person out in the street that doesn't know anything or doesn't really care about God. Uh, it wouldn't be a baby as well that wouldn't have a clue as far as what's going on. Uh, you wouldn't be sprinkling or pouring water on somebody uh, and uh, any of the other things that you have as far as error, which we'll address here in a bit. Uh, but it's a command to be obeyed. So he had a command. Now Philip would have known about the command, all right? Because uh, he would have been one of many believers that would have been addressed by Christ himself and then also uh, following those, the apostles. And then you have now this Ethiopian eunuch who has been with Philip how long? How long a period of time? A few minutes? Maybe a few hours. You don't know how long a period. I have no idea. It doesn't really say. We just know that they met that day. Actually, you know, whatever part of the day it was. And he's traveling. So he's like, okay, whatever time it took for him to travel uh, to come across water from where he was originally uh, on his way down to Gaza and then also that time that it would have taken for him to be explained concerning who Christ was from Isaiah 53. And all of a sudden he has this idea, hey, why don't I get baptized? So that would, that's something obviously that would have been important. It's a command to be obeyed because one, it's Jesus' idea as far as baptism and it's, uh, it's, it's what Christ desires. It's for the believer, it's healthy, it's the first step of obedience really that you should have is that I'm declaring my allegiance to Jesus and uh, hey look Jesus saved me and it's uh, the same thing as with um, for me the easiest way to remember is the way a uh, person when they get married um, well you see I don't have it written on but um, yeah. all right <laughs> one two three four five six seven okay uh, for those of you that are married uh, on your ring finger on your right hand, what do you all have? If you can hold it up. Okay. Yeah, you got a. Uh, what is that? Your left hand. Oh, it's a left hand. Oh, okay. On the right hand. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 I'm serious. I didn't know which hand was. I thought it was supposed to be the right hand. <laughs> okay. Now, what is that? What's that called? It's a ring, obviously, but a wedding ring. Now. It diamond ring. It's right hand Europe. Remember the diamond oh. ring? Okay. Okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> now that's supposed to, if somebody sees that, what are they supposed to think? I'll be married. Yeah. In other words, I've made a commitment. I'm a lead, I have an allegiance to, you know, if you're a man, to one woman. If you're a lady, then you have, you know, to one man. In other words, I, I'm, I'm not free anymore. I belong to somebody. Okay, and so that's, what baptism is, in a sense, basically, it's a declaration, and it's it, it's not like a wing, ring. It's a one-time thing that we do, uh, and it's not something that you do multiple times because Christ only died once for us, and then He rose again once for us, uh, in the same way. Uh, but it's a, in the same way that we would, you know, wear a ring is what baptism is to show, hey, I am, I'm, I'm a believer. I belong to Jesus. Okay, some errors to address. Errors to address. Okay, first one would be infant baptism. Infant baptism. Now, we haven't seen very many. Uh, we haven't looked at this, but where in Scripture would anybody ever get an idea as far as that you would have to baptize a baby? Or why, why would you baptize a baby? <coughs> Okay. 
Well, it's, what's the purpose of it? What's the purpose? Dedication. Of baptism or children? No, b baptizing a baby. Like, oh. why would you baptize a baby? Well, gro having grown up in a Presbyterian church, uh, what they do is it's a dedication to the Lord. But it's not, it's not scriptural baptism. <laughs> yes, sir? It's to make sure the infant becomes of that religion. That's one of the things. So it's a ceremony, yes. I'm sorry. It didn't originally start because um, the state churches, um, they had the parents, I guess, were baptized, but then you have all these foreigner little kids running around that aren't part of the state. That's what I've been told originally it started. There's actually, uh, there's multiple reasons. Uh, first one I want to address is it's bad doctrine, bad teaching. Go to Colossians. Go to the book of Colossians. Okay, uh, verse 11. Uh, sorry, chapter 2, chapter 2, Colossians 2, verse 11. Okay, Colossians 2, 11, it says, uh, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off uh, the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Okay, so what is that? What's that circumcision of Christ that's different from the physical circumcision that the Jews would have to do uh, on the eighth day? Uh, and then it says, Buried with him in baptism, wherein ye also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And then you being dead in your sins and is uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all uh, trespasses. Okay, so there's a fellow by the name of Origen who lived roughly one, about 185 AD to about 212, a little bit after 200 AD. Uh, and he is, uh, I, won't, I won't really call him a theologian, but he was a guy that was based out of Alexandria, Egypt, that wrote a lot concerning uh, scripture. And then he also had a view of scripture that you can take it allegorically, right? And uh, the issue with that is, is that scripture is actually meant to be taken literally, not allegorically. Uh, if there is an allegory, it's going to be like plainly stated as far as, okay, this is supposed to be a picture. But he, his approach to interpreting or reading scripture was to approach everything from an allegorical standpoint. And then um, from him, uh, you have what would be the roots of what would be modern-day Calvinism. So a lot of what you see in Calvinism present day is rooted back to a lot of his teaching. Uh, and one of the things as far as beyond just the fact that you have uh, an allegorical approach to scripture is that he would teach that, okay, Israel of today is not really Israel. In other words, we are Israel. He substitutes uh, the church, the modern church, for what would be Israel. He says, okay, Israel's really not valid anymore, so the church present day has the promises of God that were originally addressed to Israel, uh, which whatever we, we should not get, that's pretty foolish, it's pretty dumb. So what he does is he takes this passage of scripture, uh, among others, as far as to, and that's what a lot of people do, is they take this to mean that, okay, since uh, the church replaced Israel, uh, we don't have to be physically circumcised, uh, which, what was the reason for circumcision to begin with? Uh, obedience. Well, it, it was obedience to God. It was, but basically it was a way to say, hey, look, I'm, I'm part of the promises that God has. Is, is a way to declare that. Um, but we don't, we don't have that. We have a verbal declaration. And then we also have, as far as, not baby baptism, but the fact is we are baptized and that's following salvation as you know now a kid could be baptized if they're aware of their cognizant of the decision that they've made that hey I've already trusted Christ uh, it's possible for a child to be baptized as far as 
scripturally, is if they're aware of the decision that they've made, if they're cognizant of the fact that, hey, look, I've, I've got sin, and I need to address my sin issue, and Christ is the one that does that for me. In other words, I need to put my trust in Christ. And if they've done that, and then they're aware of the fact of, hey, look, that would be following baptism, but you wouldn't just randomly, you know, sprinkle pour water on some, some kid that doesn't know what's going on and say, okay, hey, you're baptized. Uh, they would say as what baptism, or excuse me, as what circumcision was, as a sign of, of God's covenant to Israel, is the same way that we present day have to baptize. And so they would do that as for a baby. Uh, again, which is stupid. And then they don't, they twist scripture. Uh, the only other two portions of scripture that you would have, uh, you would see that not only in Acts chapter 10, uh, that you could, you, people would twist, but it, it's, it's a weak argument there. Acts chapter 10, where Cornelius is born again, and then his compatriots that are with him there that he gathered are born again after he calls <coughs> Peter. Peter comes down to his house, and he has a group of Jews that are with him that are born again believers. And they witness that, okay, the Holy Ghost comes upon Cornelius and those that are in that crowd. They receive Christ, and then following that, it says that his household uh, was baptized. Now, people would conjecture to say, hey, that could have been, you would have had kids there, and maybe little kids or babies or something like that, but it doesn't say that. It just says that his household. And then you also have in Philippians, or excuse me, well, not Philippians, in Acts chapter 16, uh, after the Philippian jailer was born again, that his household followed. So his household was born again and then that he followed. But again, you have no evidence of the fact that it would have been a baby that would have been against his will, that wouldn't have been aware of what was going on. The instances where we see baptism transpire in Scripture is the same as what we would see here in Acts, uh, in Acts 8 that we saw with the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, they received the word and then they were gladly baptized. Okay, so that's the natural order. You receive Christ and then following that, you make your declaration of allegiance to him. Hey, I'm going to live for God. Or that, hey, look, I've received Christ as my Savior. I'm a believer now. I'm not, I'm not part of Satan's team anymore. I'm part of God's team now. Okay, so infant baptism. Another thing, part of what you mentioned, uh, in some of my reading, in uh, primarily from a, a two book series by a gentleman by the name of John T. Christian, uh, called History of the Baptists. Okay, um, in there, as well as uh, there's other books that you can read on that on that subject. But uh, it is mentioned, it is brought out that in parts of Europe, um, this would be obviously way following. This would be like in 1500s, 1600s that you would have um, because of the Black Death and a lot of sickness that would be going on uh, as more of a, it's more superstitious than anything else that you would have people that would, now they had obviously state churches, yes, um, during that time because the ones that protested uh, the Catholic Church still f maintained their model uh, and so they would persecute anybody that would be a, not, you know, not following according to them even though they were you know, you could say not Catholic, but really in the reality they were. Um, there was this, they approached from, this isn't, this isn't everybody's reasoning for it, but there was a lot of superstition going on, so they felt, okay, hey, if we baptize or get that kid, if we baptize our baby, then that might give them a higher chance to live. Uh, you have no medical or scientific reason for that other than just, okay, it's superstition. They, hey, you know, if I, if I baptize in them, I could, you know, maybe give them a higher chance to live, and they might, they might not get touched by the black plague. So, infant baptism. Uh, second one is baptismal regeneration, baptismal regeneration, and that is uh, you come across like Church of God or Church of Christ. Um, they're all over the South and uh, Alabama, Tennessee. Well, other states as well, but. That's where I primarily ran into it mostly. And they would state that in order for you to be born again is that you would have to not only just receive Christ, but you would have to be baptized. So baptism is included in receiving Christ. Okay. Now, um, 
they would go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 to kind of uh, establish their argument that you, you need to be baptized because that's where, and then they, they would also use Luke 24. We'll look at both. They would say Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Well, it was, you could start from verse 37. So now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and they said unto Peter and, to his, and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of, the, uh, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, repent, and be baptized every one of you. So, they would argue, uh, Church of Christ, Church of God, saying, hey, isn't it like grammatically accurate to say that that is a, uh, what's that word, and? It's a conjunction, right? So it says anything that would follow would be almost of equal what would be preceding it. So in other words, you would have to be baptized as well as repenting. So in other words, you can't just trust Christ alone. You would have to be baptized in addition. Uh, in Luke 24, it states, uh, we'll start at verse 45. It says, then, then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooves, uh, behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead that third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in all, um, in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you're witnesses. Okay, so almost the same wording, with the exception that there's no baptism that's mentioned there. But repentance and remission of sins. So you repent, you have your sins remitted, and then here he adds the fact that in Acts chapter two that you would have. Uh, it says repent and be baptized. So, uh, what would be the? Again, I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence. What would be the problem with that? What would be the problem if that were actually the case? What would be the problem with that, as far as having to add baptism to it, to the salvation? Yes, sir. Well, the thief on the cross would have a problem. Yeah. <laughs> you know, one problem. If he wasn't baptized, he was saved, he'd be with me. That's right. And anyone that's saved, he'd be with me. It would fall under a work, really. Work. That would be one argument. Uh, and the fact is, is that you go through anywhere through the book of John, as pastor's preaching through Sunday morning, uh, he repeatedly says, you just believe. You believe. You believe. Uh, have almost every instance, without exception, you go through. Actually, no, you do see that. I'd say, I'd to say that without exception, you go through in the Book of Acts, where you have large groups of believers, or even not even just large groups, but you have some, maybe like one or two or a handful that are saved. It repeatedly says they they believe, they gladly receive this word. You know, now following, I obviously they were baptized, but the fact is, um, baptism was only intended as a picture of what Christ had done. It's not intended for anything else. It's not, it doesn't do anything for you. You just, you know, if you're trusting in that, then really, all, I mean, you're trusting in work. And you just, you go down, get wet, and you come up and you're wet. But the fact is, it's meant to be as a picture. It's declaring that, hey, Jesus is who saves me. This is what he's done. It's not of me. It's, it's not of works as, you know, lest any man should boast. Okay, resting in scripture is commonplace for unlearned, proud individuals bent on promoting flesh rather than spirit dependence. Okay, people have all kind of agendas as to why they want to add things or take away things with regard to what Jesus... Yes? The main scripture the Church of Christ uses is Mark 16, 16. And it says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Uh, the obvious answer is in that verse. It's not believing that say, that 
change the Thank damn you. Jews, so obviously it's believing that saves you. Amen. That's true. But they use that a lot, and they say, uh, if you're not baptized, you're not saved. Amen. Here's the funny thing, though. <laughs> uh, let me turn there real quick. Why does it say anti Why is that? It's a Peter Bleed of Andrew's baptized. Why does it say it like that? Well, the answer is at the end of the verse. Uh, verse 17. If, uh, this is Mark 16. And then following that, this is verse 17. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, that they cast out devils, that they shall speak with new tongues, that they take up serpents, and they shall drink any deadly thing, and it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Okay, this is where you get a lot of like the faith healers. Um, how often <laughs> is It'd be a little rude, but like you could challenge somebody if you wanted to, with regard to that. If they're of that thinking, you know, here, take some bleach, you know, go ahead and have you a big, nice glass of bleach, or even some muriatic acid, you know, or uh, you know, whatever you want to throw, out. you know, maybe some, uh, take some um, rat poison, you know, see how. how <laughs> Well, I mean, he does say here that uh, these shines shall follow them that believe. You know, if, if they're going to be stringent on that, then that would be one of the things that they would have to hold to as well. Um, you do have some snake handling churches up in the mountains and stuff. Um, and you always have instances of people getting bitten and uh, having to be hospitalized. But that these would have been immediately followed as far as pertaining to the apostles themselves. We see that illustrated actually in Acts chapter 28 with the Apostle Paul when he was bitten by a serpent and he was not harmed. Um, there's other instances as well, but uh, that is a good point. Um, and it is that a person believes and it's not based on any other kind of work. Okay, um, then baptism has always been God's idea. So church didn't come up with it necessarily. Uh, it wasn't some council that said, hey, we got to add this, we got to do this, but rather it was just people that believed God in obedience to what he commanded when he gave his last commands to them. You know, go teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and then teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Uh, church was Jesus' idea, as well as baptism was Jesus' idea, as well as these other principles that we follow. Does anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. One of the things that this lesson I really think about is at the first one, 3,000 were saved and, uh, and were baptized that, that day. I don't know what time they got saved, but say they got saved at 10 o'clock and they had 10 hours of baptized. One person baptized one every minute would take 50 hours. Wow. So if you had five people baptized, you could do it in 10 hours. But you could just amazing the amount of people who were baptized and how they did it. I'm just, you know, was it everybody getting the water drunk? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that, that's a lot of. I, I can't even imagine 3,000 people standing in one area hardly unless you're in a big stadium or something. Doesn't say they were baptized in one day. Well, and yeah, I think it does. I think it did. They were. They well, they did. They were baptized. Yeah, I think they were. All three thousand. I think so. Uh -huh. I think they were. Just added to the church. Daily since such as you can see. So that just amazes me. That amount of people. That is something that's pretty interesting logistically. Yeah. Another thing that actually you just brought to mind that it didn't cover. Um, there is no instruction with regard to who administers it. In other words, you see uh, Philip, and then in in the case with the three thousand after Peter preached, who would have been who would have been there? You had the hundred and twenty that were believing already, so it could have been all one hundred and twenty were crap. 
I would assume, I'm going to assume that all 120 were actively uh, taking part in baptizing somebody. <coughs> but out of those 120, you only had 12 that were actually apostles. Everybody else was just a, you know, just a believer. Not that there's any hierarchy. Yes, sir? Well, they had to get somewhere to water. They're, they're, they're in the temple. There's no place to baptize them there. So they would have had to go down to, I, I don't know, the, the, maybe a pool or a Roman pool or something like that, somewhere away from the temple. It, they wouldn't be baptized in the labor, certainly. That was, so, I, you know, it just says they were baptized. We just have to, I don't think we need to worry about the mechanics of it. Well, but, it's just amazing no. that, that many people, can, it's amazing 3,000 people yeah. got saved in one day. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's great. And then, uh, and again, anybody can administer <coughs> baptism. In other words, it doesn't have to be a pastor necessarily. You know, father wants to baptize his child. I can't afford to do that. Uh, it just has to be somebody that would be believing. <coughs> That's the only. Uh, that would be the rule for the candidate. It would be somebody that would be believing. Okay. All right. Any more questions or? Okay, uh, next week we'll be looking at the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper. If not, we're dismissed. <laughs>